Welcome to the Granby Board of Education meeting. Uh, today is Wednesday, October 12, 2022. Here we are at the high school. Thank you um, to the high school and the staff uh, for accommodating us this evening. Uh, I'd like to start by welcoming high school principal Mike Dunn, and he has a couple of staff members here who will be presenting Mrs. Henze and Mrs. Patton. Thank you both for being here, um, as well as some students. So we're looking forward to hearing from all of you uh, later this evening. And with that, I will turn it over to uh, Dr. Grossman for superintendent announcement. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for uh, attending this meeting and for those of you that are online th this evening. I also want to welcome our partners from Bramby Memorial High School and especially our staff members, uh, Mrs. Henze and Mrs. Patton, and excited to hear Kelsey and Cole speak also. I do want to let the board members know that unfortunately Tess is sick this evening and our other student uh, member, board member Chase, is out there playing in the soccer game uh, right now. So we won't have a student uh, report. I do want to let the board know, and I, I wrote to you in my update, that I'm working extremely hard with the town and with our facilities department regarding our high school track. Uh, many members of our community use our high school track besides our student athletes and our students in physical education class. And there is an area that is causing puddling to one section of the track. We are really trying to figure out what it is. So we've had a few consultants come out and look at it and no one seems to know what is causing that puddling and uh, we now have another consultant coming out next week to do some uh, boring, some holes into the track to go down maybe 10 or 15 feet to see what may be causing this uh, puddling. So I do want to let the board and the community know, just like I reported last month on our fields, that I'm looking at our fields. I'm also spending a lot of time looking at our track, make sure that our community is able to use our track safely and our student athletes and our students are able to use that track. Very exciting news that the Granby Public Schools team will be presenting tomorrow at the Connecticut State Department of Education Performance Matters Conference. If you recall, Mrs. Parsons, the assistant superintendent, when she gave our student achievement report at one of our last meetings that we were asked by the state of Connecticut to present our incremental growth and how we are making growth within the Granby Public Schools. And we're excited that Ann Belding, Courtney Petrowski, and Dawn Olson will also be presenting with Mrs. Parsons, and I will also be uh, taking a trip out to Hartford tomorrow to support this team. Very exciting, our robotics team will be presenting at the Senior Men's Breakfast this Friday at the Senior Center. The construction project at the high school is moving along very well, as, as, long, as also the video production studio. We do have our board walk on Friday, for those of you that will be joining in, and we will take you into uh, the new section of the building, but we'll also have other times for the board members to uh, go into those sections also. And as I mentioned in my last letter to the community, we'll also have a community event where we'll invite the community in to walk the, the building when it is done. You're going to ask me when it's done. We're looking at sometime, hopefully late November, maybe the beginning of December. Creation of the fiscal year 24 budget is certainly well underway at the building levels and meetings will begin with administrators in November. I want to remind the board that our next scheduled board meeting will be held next Wednesday, October 19th, and we'll be back at town hall in, in the meeting room with a finance meeting before that. I'll take any questions out of the superintendent's office at this time. Thank you, Dr. Grossman. Uh -huh. Any board members have questions for Dr. Grossman? Great, thank you. And I was remiss um, at the beginning of the meeting. Our um, Donna uh, Nolan, our board member, is not here, and she usually acts as our secretary. So Rosemary is wondering if you would be willing to know any action items that we have to make. So in her place. So thank you very much. 
Um, with that, I will turn that over to our assistant superintendent, Jen Parsons, for her monthly report. Hello, everyone. Um, I wanted to take an opportunity tonight to update you on some of the committee work that has been happening in district as we move towards a lot of our professional development coming up. So in the past uh, week, we have been able to have our first meeting of our Granby Equity team for the year. Very exciting this year. I have a co-facilitator in the work, Ms. Jackie Patton, who is also here tonight. So as we did last year, we'll be running a few internal meetings and we'll be running some meetings with our consultants from the Partners in Educational uh, Leadership. So our first meeting focused on the theme of representation matters and we really spent a lot of time talking about our learning environment, tying in our equity work with the work we've been doing around elements of effective instruction and making sure that our learning environments are representative of our student demographics. So that was really exciting. Our next meeting will be in um, early November with our partners from Educational Leadership. Also last week, we had our first meeting of the, the district-wide social-emotional learning committee that I co-facilitate with Ms. Angela Aaronworth. And at that meeting, we revisited the goals that we set forward last year and really talked about how each school is moving forward the work in terms of creating their, their inter-staff working agreements, revisiting rules and expectations at the beginning of the school year, and looking at our students and what supports they may need throughout the course of the school year. So those are just two of our exciting committees. We have STEAM and wellness coming up in the next few weeks. I can bring back reports from as well. Thank you very much. Um, any questions for the assistant superintendent's office? I'm getting used to this new setup here. I don't know where <laughs> everyone is. So, Okay, and um, Dr. Gross, when you said we're going to skip over the student um, Representative reports, we wish uh, Chase good luck out on the soccer field and hope that um, Tess is feeling better soon. So moving on to schools in the spotlight. Mr. Dunn, I know you have some staff and students here ready to talk a little bit about uh, about their experiences over the summer. So I'll hand it over to you. Thank yes, you. we do. Thank you very much. And very briefly, I'd like to thank and introduce our awesome students, Cole Max and Kelsey Stickles who participated this summer in our college explorations program uh, that was facilitated by Mara Henze, who is our college and career coordinator, as well as Jackie Patton. This is uh, a program that's been running since 2008, and it is actually uh, the first time that we've been able to run it since, I think, 2019 was the last time, which was the last time that Mara uh, was able to facilitate it. So she's literally done it two times in a row. It's just that we had two years uh, that were interrupted by the pandemic. Uh, this is an amazing program uh, that exposes our students to uh, several colleges, the whole entire college process. Um, in other schools in the spotlights I've come, we've, we've talked about college programs, we've talked about career. In the spring, we'll be sharing some, some of our work around career as well. Uh, but without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce us uh, to our wonderful team. Thank you very much. Hello. Um, I am excited to... <laughs> I'm excited to share with you guys our college tour this year. Um, it was fun to organize, and it was interesting to figure out what campuses we could see, um, given still some um, COVID protocols in place, so that was exciting. Um, but we ended up having a wonderful time. Um, the goal of the program was to design a financially accessible introduction to a variety of different schools um, and really supply a forum for kids to ask questions and share ideas regarding each school. Um, they'll tell you, maybe, at least some of the kids would tell you that my motto there was, you don't know what you don't know. And they are probably sick of me saying that. because I say it all the time um, because they found out that they didn't know a lot when we got to the campuses. And it was good because learning what you don't like is as valuable as learning what you do like. We had 20 participants um, coming from five different towns. We had um, Hartford, Heartland, Granby, Windsor, and Suffield represented, and a huge diversity of students within that. Um, so it was interesting to see how each one brought their own questions to the table. Uh, various. As you can see, we did a four-day program this year to keep momentum. Um, each school, we did a guided tour. And then um, at Southern, 
uh, Salve, Regina, and Uhart. We had information sessions. And University of Rhode Island actually let us have at their um, dining hall. And we got to experience the food court, which was really fun and a little overwhelming. Um, but it was, it was excellent. Um, let's see. These are some of the terms that popped up. Um, Jackie and I kept a running list of different questions kids asked so that we could circle back and make sure that they felt comfortable with what they were learning, if there were questions that didn't get answered, things along those lines. So this is just a few of those things. At each school, because we had 20 students, we were split up into two groups. So Jackie being there was crucial um, just so that we could kind of keep an ear to what's happening. And then every day, to, since this was a, a paid event that kids pitched in, parents paid for, I did do a wrap-up for each day to explain to the parents what we had learned and um, kind of keep them in a loop, share some pictures, that kind of stuff. And that's about it for me. However, I am going to let you talk with our students. We're going to do Kelsey Stickles first. Okay, I'm Kelsey Stickles, and um, I was one of the two seniors who were on the college trip this year. I found out about the trip through my stepsister, who is now a sophomore here at a Fairby High, and um, I immediately jumped on the opportunity because um, I was I was like, oh my gosh, this is this is amazing! Like we're gonna go see colleges. I don't have to worry about scheduling it myself. It just made it so easy, um, and there were. As she mentioned, lots of kids from other schools, so I didn't really feel like an outsider, like this was only a Granby thing. Um, so I have transferred here for senior year. And <laughs> to go back to how easy it was, I really liked how it was scheduled. Like there was no, hey mom, can you get work off today? Can you go see a college? It just made it so easy to have like, all right, this week, I took it off from work, I blocked out my calendar, we're going to see colleges every day, and we're talking to tour guides, we're talking to we're talking to representatives there, and we're talking to people who really know the campus and know how lost we are as trying to figure out what we're going to do with the next years of our life. Um, it was my first time seeing a lot of different colleges in person, and it automatically gave me an idea of where I wanted to be and what I wanted to be around. Um, twisting, you're saying you don't know what you don't know, you don't know what you don't see. Um, and the variety to me was very important. We saw everywhere from public to private, religious to non-religious, expensive, non-expensive, big, small, local, not local. Um, and two of the schools we saw were UConn and URI, and I automatically fell in love. And those are now two of the top schools I'll be applying to coming up. And um, this trip really inspired me to take that jump on figuring out college and really get excited about it because before it was like this scary topic that I didn't want to enter. So, thank you. Hello, um, I'm Cole Max. I um, I went on a trip. <laughs> um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about how. Um, it was so good for my anxiety um, because I was always so anxious about trying to find like what schools I wanted to visit. Um, and like, um, once again, the busy schedules of parents. Uh, <laughs> and it made it feel a lot more comfortable when you're with your peers. It's a lot easier to ask questions when you're around a group of people you know rather than going with people who have their parents. Um, and it taught me a lot, as um, Ms. Henry always says, you don't know what you don't know. I love that quote. Um, because I learned um, like that some colleges have LGBTQ centers, um, that they uh, have student uh, disability services, which I did not know. I have dyslexia, and I thought I was going to be all by myself, which it was a big relief when I found that stuff out. Um, and it just 
my anxiety melted away, especially having two amazing people to take us on these tours. Um, and yeah, thank you. Um, so <laughs> um, we just had a few last pictures we were able to get from our trip. Um, Salve Regina was like literally the most beautiful day to be in Rhode Island, um, as you can see. Um, and we also had a lot of fun when we were in New Haven. Uh, we got to experience a school bus on Worcester Street, which was really exciting. Um, and then the highlight of our trip might be the dairy bar, of course, um, because that was just the, um, Those are our pictures of the trip. So thank you so much. I hope this is helpful. Do you guys have any questions? Well, no, I don't have any questions right away, but I just love that both these students kind of touched on, uh, it's, it's a lot of work, and I want to recognize and acknowledge that planning, I think there were eight schools, is that right, that you visited? Um, and I've tried to organize for my kids and done the college trip, and you both mentioned it's hard for my parents to get time off from work, it's hard to make the plans, it's hard to know what's here, what's there, so thank you for having this as an opportunity for our students. Um, because it really is wonderful to have your eyes open up, and you really don't know what you don't know, and you haven't seen it, you don't know what there is. So thank you for allowing that opportunity. I'm, I'm grateful that we have that from our school. I'm curious, um, how did we get in touch with other schools, kids from other communities to come? Oh, um, we had, as Kelsey said, her stepsister is a student here, and then now Kelsey is a student here. She transferred to finish her senior year. Exciting. Um, um, but we also had Kim Bressum. She had two um, sophomores join us. I'm sorry, Kim Tazazola had two sophomores join us. And then um, they get the picture from Suffield and Windsor. And then our okay. Okay. Yep. Thank you. A couple, anybody else? Do you have any questions or feedback for our students and us as presenters? Did you, and now, yes, um, to, the, to the students, um, can you tell us, was there something that when you went into the college exploration process that you maybe had a preconceived notion about, maybe I want a small school, I want a large school, something like that, that once you went through this process, you discovered something about yourself and maybe what your interests are. Yeah. And, and welcome, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> welcome to Grant. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I guess I would say school size at first. I was a little worried, especially Granby. Well, my school before was a little bigger than Granby, but still small population. Um, and I found out, I was like, I saw your eye in UConn. I was like, I can do this. Like, I can be in this bigger campus, this bigger area with a lot of opportunities. Um, and I think that was probably the biggest thing. Yeah, school size, knowing that I would be OK in like a bigger campus, just from seeing it and seeing how people function. Um, for me personally, I uh, always thought the higher the price tag, the better the school. But when I went to, um, when we visited Southern, I was like, this is an amazing school for such a low price. And I just, that's mainly what I was like. I was like, I have to get so many loans out uh, so I go to a good school so I get a good job. But really, it's not about price tag. It's about the um, work they do there. And I just have one last kind of question. Um, I know in the past, uh, sometimes you've been able to interact with alumni, GMHS alumni, who maybe are at schools. And I think uh, a few years ago, you had maybe a panel. That, okay. Um, do you see that in the future? Or do you, or, and what else might you see in the future? Oh, absolutely. That would be amazing. Um, we, this ended up being put together a little more quickly than I would have um, probably, like, I would have planned a different adding. A, um, a panel, definitely. But I also want to limit the amount of time because having that four days really allowed um, the, 
the kids that did sign up to commit to the whole time um, instead of cherry picking which days at the schools they liked. Um, and a lot of families, given the summer, tend to take off on Friday, and so we wanted to respect that. Um, so trying to work that in would be ideal to have maybe one longer day or two longer days um, to have a panel because hearing from some former students Wonderful. Thank you. Eight schools in four days is an intense schedule. So uh, thank you for doing that. And I'm glad that you all had your eyes open. That's a really great opportunity. So, thank you. Great. Okay. Public comment. Um, if anyone uh, in, in the auditorium would like to make public comment, please come on up. Is there a, I can't tell if there's a microphone. There's a mic down. Oh, thank you. Yes, there's a mic down there. If you're interested in making public comment, please come on up um, and let us know who you are and what you're thinking. And if after we look in house, we'll look online. I don't think there is anyone online. Oh, I'll make one last call for public comment. Okay, let's move on to consent agenda. Do I have a motion? Thank you, Rosemary. Is there a second? Thank you, Monica. Uh, is there any discussion? Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Or abstain? Motion carries. Old business. There is no old business. So under new business, uh, Mr. Dunn, we get to have a visit from you again uh, for the continuous improvement plan from Grand Bay Memorial High School. Super. Um, Mr. Straw, I'm just going to speak for a, a minute or two about the remind the board of the continuous improvement plan process. If we remember correctly, when I presented the superintendent goals, which align to the Remy Public Schools strategic plan, the next phase is really now us going into the continuous improvement plans. And what we're trying to do is each school principal and department for director of pupil services will come to you over the next four or five meetings and present to you their continuous improvement plan. What we're going to try to do this evening with the high school is to make it, it more interactive for you that if you have any questions. So as you know, we have goal areas. So after each goal area, Mr. Don is going to ask you if you have any questions regarding that specific goal area. Reminder in his presentation, he's not going to go over everything in the continuous improvement plan. That, that's why we were asking you to read the continuous improvement plan before this meeting. He's going to give you highlights and go as deep as he can in, in the time that we're allotted for in this continuous improvement plan presentation. But I just want to remind you that after... Each goal area, Mr. Dunn will just stop, he'll pause, and ask if there's any board questions. And we'll want to be mindful uh, of the time also because we have uh, several goal areas to go through. So I want to thank Mr. Dunn and his team is here tonight. Mrs. Greeny is here and Dr. Calcasola is here. And I want to thank his uh, administrative leadership team also for putting what I feel and Mrs. Parsons feel a great plan together. Mr. Dunn. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Grossman, and thank you to the board. I want to also thank um, I want to thank Cole and Ms. Patton and Ms. Henze uh, and um, Kelsey once more for that amazing, uh, wonderful per uh, presentation. I should also point out, I neglected to point out earlier that so Dr. Calcatola had her two boys join uh, that program this year. I have also had two of my own children join in the past, and so has Mrs. Greeny. So we have six administrator kids who have benefited from that program as well. Uh, I also want to just note and thank, uh, I know they're, neither of them are able to be here tonight, but I'm certainly proud of Tess and Chase for, for all that they do to share our, our school culture um, each week uh, at the board meetings. So thanks as well for the opportunity uh, to present about our um, school and our continuous improvement plan. I, I do feel uh, very excited because uh, I've done this many times uh, since being a principal at Kelly Lane. I really feel like this is among the strongest and most tightly aligned continuous improvement plans that I've been uh, able to present. It's also had the highest degree of staff input, both with our 
full staff, but also with our school leadership team. Um, and lots of uh, important feedback as well. I want to thank Dr. Grossman and Mrs. Parsons for, for meeting with me as well. Um, and this is also a tremendous amount of alignment with the board goals, with the district improvement plan and strategic plan, uh, and with our district SEL plans um, and our anti-bias and anti-racism plan as well. So we're just going to stop off on a couple of uh, quick introductory slides. First of all, uh, I don't just zoom through this one. Uh, I am going to be a broken record every time I come across this um, because I think this is a wonderful document. Um, but also, one of our central strategies in terms of our improvement this year and going forward is to make explicit intentional connections to our vision of the Granby Public Schools graduate. Um, and I, again, thank the board for, for their support of the work that had been done to create this. Uh, this will continue to guide our efforts going forward. It is not irrelevant for me to share that we are right now in the smack in the middle of our decennial uh, accreditation cycle. We are five years in from our last accreditation visit, which happened in 2018, but you will probably hear me talk about that a little bit more as we go over uh, certainly into the next few years in every single piece of that accreditation process that happens uh, in five years from now will be based on our alignment to this document. So that's why as captain of the ship, uh, I'm just gonna keep that on our on our minds. Um, and uh, we talked about this with our staff and faculty today. Um, and every single thing that we do with curriculum assessment, instruction, resources um, will be uh, measured along these lines. So that's something that you see in all of the school improvement plans. What is unique is this next slide. Uh, I feel uh, it's important as well to share uh, just this uh, slide, which I've used now in, and I'm trying to use in every presentation that I give for students, for staff, um, for parents. Um, it, this is really my way, my own vision of how we articulate uh, what we're all about in this very special school uh, and in this very special town. We're focused on our core values. We're focused on our mission to widen opportunities. Almost everything we talk about tonight will be about widening opportunities and removing barriers to them and maximizing our students' success wherever their journey takes them. So if it's college, if it's career, wherever it takes them beyond our walls. So this is really the win. Uh, and what I'm gonna be presenting is really the sales and the rigging uh, as we <laughs> journey forward. Um, and what I'd again like to do is present each goal one at a time. Uh, there is quite a lot uh, of content in the goals. And then again, we'll stop as Dr. Grossman said uh, each, each time uh, to take questions from the board. So first is that after what we know have been the past few challenging years, we're excited that we are full throttle uh, in our efforts uh, to increase achievement. This is our first goal area. It's the board's first goal area student learning and achievement, we at the high school have two goals under this goal. Uh, and the first is to increase the percentage of ninth, 10th and 11th graders scoring at benchmark on PSAT. Just today, our 10th and 11th graders took the PSAT um, and we'll be talking about our goal areas around that. I'd also like to point out that on the plan and as well on these slides, we've made a specific reference to related areas on our strategic plan. So for instance, right after you see where it says goal 1A achievement, you see in parentheses GPS 1D, that comes right out of the, uh, that's a reference to where you can find the, um, the connection to our strategic plan. So I also wanna start right out of the gate with what has been presented both last spring and what Assistant Superintendent Jen Parsons presented just a few weeks ago in the data, the district data report that we certainly have work to do. Uh, we know that uh, we have been engaged in that work and continue to engage in that work and specifically around some lagging areas when it comes to PSAT, especially in math. So I'm gonna share some very specific goal targets around that um, and that's gonna come on the next slide as well. But I am very uh, proud and happy to report that we are off to a super start this year. Many of the steps that are up here, we've actually begun already. And this also reflects work that began last year as well. Um, so before our 10th and 11th graders took this morning's PSAT, they had multiple opportunities to practice with PSAT aligned questions and benchmarks in classes. They did that in English, they did it in math, social studies and science. They also linked their college board accounts 
specifically uh, to Khan Academy in math class. They received explicit instruction in large groups and small groups even in these first seven weeks of school. And then again, this, this uh, ties back to work that we began last year. And this includes uh, even things like test taking strategies, even in a video that I made during advisory. Um, and I'm gonna be talking a little bit about our PLC work. So our PLC work focuses during PLC meetings on teachers and teams diving into the data and looking at specific areas for our students. We're also going to be talking about a an adjustment that we're making to our PLC time, which is very exciting, which I'll talk about a bit later. Uh, we did have a session uh, a few weeks ago uh, where our entire certified staff met here in the auditorium to, yes, take a simulated PSAT. And the reason that we did that uh, specifically is to better understand the kinds of thinking and skills that our students need in order to be successful on PSAT. So it was actually really powerful. Uh, they had a lot of great takeaways in terms of even things like making sure that our students are reading the questions well and understanding what's being asked of them. Uh, and that again, that thinking, one of the things that we keep going back to is that that thinking isn't just something that's measured on the PSAT, it also is the thinking that's articulated on our vision of the graduate. That's the, the connection there as well. So we also, uh, that work helped to inform our teachers and departments as they make uh, and develop their specific departmental plans. We started that work last year. There's a lot more specificity and refinement in those plans this year with specific goals, with benchmarks that are actually uh, mirror the types of questions that students see on PSAT. Um, and I also wanna mention that uh, with our leadership team and our faculty, uh, very first meetings of the year, we shared the uh, significant amount of work that we did over the summer uh, with a, a uh, really deep data dive to look at our PSAT and SBAC data on our students. So before I leave this slide, just kind of wrap this slide up and I'll take questions even about these steps before I jump into the next slide. Um, but this work as well as our continued work around increasing our own fluency with College Board, with College Board reports and developing these benchmarks in um, in our departments, refining our interventions and using our weekly PLC time to help our students. This really does reflect our the seriousness of our commitment. Uh, and I just wanna say uh, very clearly, we are working hard on this because this is important to us. Uh, the PSAT is a measure of our students' opportunities uh, and there's nothing more important than that for us. Uh, and as we, we uh, I can repeat that, it's be also because we had a lot of work to do and a lot of work that we, um, that remain. So before I jump into the next slide, that's gonna bring us to some more specificity around goals. Are there any, and I can jump back to this after the next slide as well during the question part, um, but I didn't know if anyone had any specific questions about these steps. So thank you, that um, is the second to last of this. And if you're on the plan itself, um, this is in the, the bullet that says develop opportunities across disciplines for students to practice revising work, solving problems, supporting claims, and then reestablish writing tutors. So that actually refers to both um, work that we are doing with our uh, departments around supporting student writing, but also uh, a program that we had several years ago um, where students were actually uh, tutoring each other in writing as well. So it's a peer tutoring program that we're gonna be reinstituting. It's, it's, uh, it's kind of embedded in that, that other, that sixth bullet point there. Um, and you know, right in front of where it says define assessment calendar benchmarks and data team conversation. So it's a piece, it's one piece of a puzzle, um, but it is something that uh, we felt that there was some value in that we wanted to, to reestablish as well.
So, so you think that what was happening in terms of between our student tutors and uh, existing staff that uh, resurrect that program? Yes, we feel like we can resurrect that program. Yep, that's that's what uh, we are excited to have that as a as a way that students can connect with each other. And and we've had tutoring in the past like that, uh, peer tutors. Um, right, I think NHS still does that. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Um, I had a quick question. I was just hoping you could clarify for me. What do you mean by increased data capacity um, to target classroom interventions? That increased data capacity do you mind clarifying that as well sure absolutely actually i can point you to the plan itself as well it's it's actually uh, step number five and it's sort of uh important enough that we wanted to include it both in this first goal area as well as in our professional learning goal area so it's actually a repeat uh in the plan and it says increased teacher and team capacity and accessing analyzing and using psat data to target interventions at the classroom level so we have begun that work, um, but we can't say that where we ended off last year was that we were at a universal uh, level of, um, of uh, mastery on that particular area, especially given the wealth of information that is available to us on the college board and how we use data in our teams. So that is, again, to continue to increase that capacity and specifically to look at what that looks like at the classroom level when we look at some of the reports that, that we have available to us. Some of that might make a little bit more sense if I keep going on to the next slide, because these are really kind of part A and part B of the next slide. So, okay. So this chart, this summarizes where our students performed on their most recent PSAT prior to this morning. So these are specific targets uh, that we have even for this morning's test. And I first want to spend a minute just orienting you to the chart. And this is also repeated for you in the packet. Um, on the left is the grade level. And that's followed by the specific college-ready benchmarks for each test. And you can see that those benchmarks increase as you go through the years. In the middle column, those are both the percentage as well as the number of students who performed at specific performance levels relative to those benchmarks. Um, on their most uh, recent experience with PSAT or a PSAT 8.9, uh, similar but slightly different product. And as we are unique uh, in having an, a major assessment in the fall, the other schools um, really report a lot about their spring data, which we will come back to as well with our CPSAT in the spring. The fourth column are specific goal targets that we actually set for today's PSAT. In the case of our ninth graders, that is going to be for their PSAT 8-9, which they will take in December. So the last column is based on that. We have a placeholder for our next goals, which we will jump right into and set intentionally, leaving blank for now. As a major part of our work, again, is that exact uh, question that was just asked about increasing our capacity around PSAT and using that to target instructional interventions for our students and we will get our results from today's test in December and identify groups of students who at that point will need specific instructional support and intervention and we will set goals at that point and I will be able to share those specific goals with the subcommittee uh, when I meet I think we're talking about uh, meeting in the winter that's when I'm going to be coming to the subcommittee so one thing that you'll see is a concern right out of the gate has been our flat and even declining numbers of students at benchmark in math as for example with our current juniors so in addition to the steps that i outlined above i would like to point out how many students performed in the yellow band for example with math you can see there's 25 students who, who performed in the yellow band what the yellow band means is approaching benchmark so that is within 30 points of benchmark. In PSAT scores, um, you may know, are uh, indicated by groups of 10. So in effect, that is within three points, uh, which means within a year's growth. So we did be, uh, begin work last year to meet individually and in small groups of students. That remains a very important and specific action step for us this year. And um, not only for our students who are in the yellow, who are approaching, but also for students who are um, in the red band who need to strengthen skills. 
teachers and teams are setting specific goals for their students uh, based on the PSAT, based on the information that we have now, and as well, we'll revise those goals based on what the information that we receive in December. Uh, and in these case of, of these 11th graders, we did have students who grew. We actually had 61% of our students who did better, but they often didn't do better enough to jump a color, to jump to a new level uh, and to get up to the green. So we had slightly more uh, who, who may have dropped a color. So we've talked a lot about what may have contributed to that, just to let you know kind of under the hood how we think through this. Several factors, you know, in addition to everything else that's obvious around uh, the last couple of years. But one piece is that for this particular junior class, they were the first, sorry, they were the class whose algebra one year was actually the most interrupted during the pandemic. So that's a possibility that that had an impact. This 10th grade test that they took last year is also the first time that they have questions around passport to advanced math. So that was an area that was actually low, um, as was the heart of algebra strand. Uh, and we take that information. There's another strand, problem solving and data analysis. Uh, one of the things that we do is we look at ways in which we can give our kids experiences of that across grade levels. So for instance, problem solving and data analysis often asks kids to examine and analyze graphic representations of information in charts and graphs and things like that. And that is work that we support and we're uh, a lot more intentional this year about supporting across disciplines, science, health, wellness, uh, practical arts, social studies, et cetera. Um, in ERW, so once more, um, every other principal will talk about ELA, but I will talk about ERW because the way that that is um, this, uh, named at, for PSAT, SAT is evidence-based reading and writing. That is the test area. Um, and the lower scores there were in expression of ideas. And our work around that includes um, providing our students with more practice and looking closely at text and author's craft, analyzing author's craft, et cetera, engaging students even more so in revising their own work, which actually was a uh, piece that we're working a lot on before the pandemic. We actually had started that process. We want it, we're um, going to be continuing, going back to that work of giving kids more opportunity to revise their work. So our goals at this point are about moving as many students as we can to benchmark. And again, it's reflected in the multiple steps uh, that we're taking, and I will look forward to sharing our progress with the subcommittee again this winter. So that is pretty much goal area one a, um, and I'm happy to take more questions about this one before we move on to the next piece of the achievement goal. You're welcome. Uh, okay. um, is there a way with the data to also see, because I know in the high school that different levels, whether like physics, academic level, math, honors math, class, is there a way to translate how they're falling in the green, yellow, red, and We could do that. We I could. Just didn't know if that was like that. Yeah, we could. So one, we want, frankly, every teacher to be looking at their entire class right. list and knowing kind of where they have yep. kids who are in the red, yellow, or green in that regard. But I think in terms of, that's an interesting analysis to think about where our kids are performing based on their grade performance and based on what they uh, are able to do to demonstrate mastery of particular standards in a particular level of class. So we haven't done that yet. We could do that. Um, and I think it would be fairly doable to take that, to take this information and match it up to uh, just put another column in the spreadsheet. Right? That yep. Kids in honors math or honors English, could be the one screening might find out that it's, it's you know, Sometimes that's the case, and sometimes it might not be the case. So yeah, and I, while I'm on that note, a lot of the conversations and messaging that we've had with students even leading up to today has been about things like um, test taking strategies and um, you know there is sometimes a confidence factor that jumps into play um, and just having kids realize you know um, things like you don't you're not penalized for wrong answers um, it actually rewards you to take an educated guess if you can eliminate 
certain choices. So it's a little bit sometimes just, you know, kind of de-stressing the kids. And sometimes our kids who were in some of those uh, classes uh, in some of the uh, AP and honors level classes also do get stressed out. And sometimes even they sometimes second guess themselves on a, on a, on a test situation like that. You're welcome. Okay, so moving on to, uh, this is goal, this is still goal, goal one. This is goal 1B. We call this an opportunity goal, but it's really, you could say that both of uh, these first two goals are both achievement as well as opportunity goals. Um, but this particular goal is uh, a continuation, you may remember um, from last year, that we would like every student to enroll in at least one college credit bearing course uh, while in high school. This aligns with our graduation requirements and what we mean by college credit bearing courses is, is listed there, advanced placement or AP, uh, UConn's early child, uh, sorry, early college experience or ECE, and then the various ways in which we partner with as Nantuck Community College, including our college career pathways, high school partnership program and our college connections program. So this I say, I'm gonna continue to say it, we are a relatively small school. Um, we have a remarkable amount of opportunities for students to receive college credit while they're in high school. And I want to be really clear, this is an inclusive goal. This is not just, let's make sure every kid is, you know, pushed into an AP class. We, we want to challenge kids to take rigorous coursework. Again, that aligns with our, with our state expectation that we do so. Um, but there's a lot of opportunities for our students. So just to give you, again, for the board's benefit, um, uh, just an example, uh, when we talk about college and career pathways through as Nuntuck, we have these pairs of classes. So we have 22 AP offerings. We have eight ECE offerings, and we have five other courses that can combine to uh, create college and career pathways. So environmental science one and two, you take that combination, you get college credit. Intro to business and marketing, marketing and personal finance. We also, in addition, have a connection with Asnotech. It's remarkable. We have a connection where students can go through the high school partnership program. Any student can take a 100 level course through that program. Uh, and as well, our college connections program is where our students who take welding or manufacturing can receive college credit as well. And I'm really proud that it was actually right before the pandemic when um, our students in the welding program came and presented to the Board of Education. So here's the good news. Our numbers are strong in this area. I've indicated that here. And if you look at last year's uh, graduating class, so literally the class of 22, 89% of students had at least one college credit bearing class. This year's class of 23, and this again, it's about what happened when they registered for this year. So that's why it's kind of retroactive. Is at 92% and our target is to get to 95% for the class of 24. So this is a lot to be proud of in Granby. Um, it's a lot to be proud of because it comes through board support. It doesn't happen magically. It comes with a lot of attention. It comes with your support of our programs like um, our AP Summer Boost. It comes with a lot of specific messaging, intentional messaging, you know, those conversations that happen, uh, teacher to student, counselor to student, um, to, uh, through the scheduling process. It comes through ensuring that we have credentialed staff available. Uh, and again, uh, we just can't speak highly enough of our partnership with Esmontech Community College. So any questions about this one? Excuse me, I have one quick question. I, I think, well, I'm trying to remember now, but um, is there a fee to take the e, to get the ECE credit? And if yes. so, I forget are, the, the are we specifics. providing I thought so, 150, 200. So um, do we provide any assistance to those who need it? We would provide assistance through the normal ways in which we provide assistance when students and families may fill out uh, a request for assistance uh, through um, a, a free and reduced lunch uh, type of program and things like that. Um, and you know, we work a case by case basis uh, to support students um, where uh, there's a particular uh, specific need. Um, that, those are conversations that we have administratively and as well with my colleagues. And people serve. That's the only other question I had was, I, I'm curious about bullet two, about creating school policy. 
um, and what that looks like. So that is work that we're going to be doing this year. We're going to be working with our leadership team and in consultation with uh, Jennifer Parsons as well. Uh, and this kind of comes, uh, this is state policy um, that we're going to be working on this year. It also kind of dovetails with what we did last year with our graduation requirements and making sure that um, we're promoting rigorous coursework that is a, uh, aligned with the a state accountability system. So. Um, in regards to specific policy, um, the numbers are actually very encouraging <laughs> that we are on the road to doing that, but we are going to be working on language that kind of codifies that policy. Welcome. Anything else for the second? Oh. Well, actually, this is now the second goal. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, goal and B. There's lots, lots going on in that first goal. So goal two is around community engagement. And um, this is a continuous improvement plan. So uh, this, again, continues work that we embarked on earlier to improve our communication with our GMHS community through a variety of platforms. Uh, this includes the many ways that we capture and celebrate our school culture. Uh, including what Tess and Chase share about uh, each month, and a lot of different modes and methods that we're looking at and digital platforms. Uh, we're going to be going back to seasonal newsletters. We do have weekly news e-blasts, and we're always kind of aware of that kind of critical mass of how much information is coming and if there's too much, but we, uh, we're going to be moving in that direction. We are really excited this year as well, as many of you are aware, that through the uh, generosity of the Granby Education Foundation. We have a new broadcast studio, and we're really pumped that that will be up and running in time for the return of our advanced communications course in second semester. So they're just the sky's the limit for that. So that's really exciting. And I did mention uh, we have a club as well. So those are kind of working in tandem. Uh, and thanks to our, our, our teachers uh, for all the work that they've done around that. In a few weeks, we will host another Career and Technology Education Advisory Board. Uh, that has been just such a great way for our teachers to connect, uh, mostly in our practical arts department, uh, to make meaningful connections to local business and technology professionals and leaders. Uh, and our practical arts department is also exploring putting on a career fair for this spring. So those are, again, just really great ways. And I also will say again that oftentimes, sometimes we think about things as being college or career. And we're really big at Granby Memorial High School that it's college and career. All of the standards are college and career. PSAT can help you with college and career. And these college connections or uh, career connections can help you with both as well. We want to open up op opportunities for our students. Um, so finally, we are going to engage our teams and really take a look at uh, how we can increase participation uh, in attendance at some of our recurring events, including we have our curriculum open house in the fall. Uh, we have seen some declining uh, attendance in, uh, in that particular event, and we want to take a look at that and how we can kind of uh, increase that. Um, conferences as well. Next week, we will be holding a PAC meeting in our library, uh, and that will focus on a sharing of, of a summary of our continuous improvement efforts, as well as around some of the collaborative teams. We're going to be asking parents to help us on some of these collaborative teams that we're launching this year, uh, and as well, an update on the construction project. Question? So I noticed in your more detailed plan, um, you mentioned about um, increasing attendance at the curriculum night. Mm -hmm. and. What's your measure for that? So, do you know? Do you, do you track how many people are going to the open or to the curriculum night, or was it just a was it just a feel? I don't know. Yeah, it's a feel. It's a feel. Yeah, it's. I mean, <laughs> we haven't actually uh, tracked. We we should probably, um, but we know that we've seen kind of a. It seems like it's just been kind of, you know, maybe a little bit downward over the last few years. Uh, this one felt like there were fewer people, and we actually had a conversation about that. Yeah, um, yeah. We don't know. I mean, we came so quick at the beginning of the year. I mean, people were still dropping kids off at college. You know, it, it might have been a piece of the timing. We talked a little bit about the, the marketing of that, and, you know, we're going to be taking a look at that. But um, 
I think having a way that we can at least ask teachers to keep track of how many people show up. Uh, again, we're, um, we probably had an easier way of <laughs> tracking that when we had it virtually, right, uh, in right. a way, because uh, you can take a snapshot of how many faces are on the screen. Um, but I think with signups and things like that, it could be pretty easy to do that. Any other questions for goal number two? Okay. Goal number three. Okay. Another broken record is that we can't do anything with achievement unless we have creative or uh, supportive and uh, caring um, environments and relationships. And we're really proud of the relationships that our teachers and staff have with students. So it really is a yin and a yang. Um, you can't really have one without the other. You can't just have a supportive environment if you're not challenging students to do their best uh, and, and providing them rigorous opportunities. But at the same time, you really can't challenge them unless you have that support. So this goal area is, again, to continue uh, that work to develop, um, as I say here very specifically, create safe, inclusive, equitable, and socially, emotionally responsive school and classroom learning environments. So as with last year's work, this does continue, um, as was mentioned earlier, to align with our work with the Great Schools Partnership around the elements of effective instruction, specifically in the learning environment area. Many of you have uh, attended learning walks where you've been looking very closely at that. Um, this year, we actually are also receiving training to uh, on a tool called the DESA, uh, which is going to help us uh, better understand our students' social and emotional needs. We are, again, I'm going to mention uh, how we're going to be incorporating through our adjusted PLC time some regular opportunity for the reinstatement or rebooting of our Safe School Climate slash SEL team, and that is in alignment with our district SEL plan. Uh, this work also includes um, using our vision of the graduate to help us articulate you know, who we are, what we want to be um, in terms of essential school-wide commitments for staff. Uh, this also includes uh, the very important step of increasing student leadership on teams, and that will include things like an, a team that we're getting together around examining our grading practices, uh, as well as dealing kind of more complex, comprehensively with the challenges and implications of social media, which is such a big part of our kids' lives. So we did mention interventions in the achievement plan. It's also relevant here because both SEL as well as achievement, uh, there are implications for how we intervene with students. And then finally, uh, we're really excited this year to implement the, the uh, really great initiatives that our students earn for us. And I think I mentioned this uh, the last time I presented at the board. It was right after we heard from the state uh, that they had accepted not one but two of the Voice for Change uh, initiatives through the Voice for Change program. And our, we couldn't be more proud of our students. Uh, one project is around social and emotional support and mentoring, and another is around food insecurity and addressing that. Can you tell us just a little bit about, I know DESA is a new tool, but what exactly does that entail? Is that, and I think you noted at advisory teachers, is this something done all the time at advisory? Is it no. just once? So this is, uh, this is new. Uh, we actually are participating, I believe, in a pilot and a cohort. Thank you, a cohort. That's a, that's a better word. Thank you. I'm looking at Angela Ehrenworth. Um, this year, we have a school-based team that is going through training uh, to learn this tool. It's a very easy, user-friendly tool. Uh, we are going to train our, our teachers during our November PD day on using this tool. It's very quick. They will use it. There's actually a couple different versions of it, but we will use it with our advisories. Um, and teachers uh, who are the advisors will administer this to students. It is uh, an online measure. It's asking students uh, a series of questions. And then it's really about, you know, what do we do with that information? So this is new for us. Um, so what happens after November is that we will uh, discuss how we use that data to help us better under. It's a screening tool. So like anything, you know, uh, it may be that we have students whose responses indicate a certain um, level of concern in terms of uh, uh, certain aspects of uh, social and emotional well-being. 
um, and others whose, uh, whose responses don't indicate that same level of concern. So we're working with our support staff, our people for pupil services staff, um, and then there will be, I believe, another administration in the spring. Three, three, thank you, three administrations um, uh, with the DESA tool. Uh, question, what does DESA stand for? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> uh, do you know? Yeah. So can I ask uh, for, can I phone a friend? Of course, absolutely. So, um, would you care to share? Devereaux, Devereaux Student Strength Assessment. Assessment. And so we're gathering information three times a year regarding the social, emotional well-being of our children. And we're using that to inform opportunity instruction on one other decisions. Um, do parents get, have access to the questions that are being asked of the students and also the data that's being, so if there's, so for example, if there is a student whose score is concerning, are, how, how are we, uh, I mean, that's, that's some very weighty information that the school district now has on students, and how are we Rosemary, I'm going to take this because it, it's actually K-12, um, and it's something that the state is initiating, and it's going to be required by all districts next year. So they're suggesting that districts jump in. So there'll be communication going out to families, and if there are, let's say, red flags that go up, that will certainly be communicated to families that there's a concern relative to how the, the, the child was um, on that. Mrs. Aaronworth, when she presents her plan um, in a few weeks, she'll really go into that in, in detail because it, it's based from the state and it will go to her office. You're going to see that in every single um, continuous plan, that, that implementation. Um. Will that include some sort of, I mean, will there be some transparency? Yes, there's so parent letters that are going to. to about the, the process. Yes. I'm talking about the actual content of the yes. administration. Yes. So, so if a parent calls up the, the, the school that their child is in and says, I want to know what, you know what the result is of that. Yeah, I, I don't see I'm looking like at Mrs. Dermot. I, I don't see an issue with that at all. question about that. <clears throat> Do you think the parents or students will be able to opt out? If the answer is yes on that, that's why we'll be sending a parent communication home. Thank you. All good questions. Any other questions on goal three? Um, just one other quick question. Um, again, in your kind of more um, detailed piece here, you talk a little bit about um, action steps uh, develop and administer regular surveys and other instruments to provide increased opportunities for student feedback. What kinds of questions are those going to be? How often? What are the kids doing this? Yeah, good What's question. Like? So we've generally used surveys. We have our climate survey that comes out in the spring. We do get really important and meaningful feedback from students. In fact, some of our goal areas and action steps are based on that student uh, feedback. What we'd like to do, especially with some of the teams, I'm going to get to really in detail on uh, goal six about the teams that we're using is we're going to be trying to use more opportunities for quicker uh, ways to touch base with students and get some feedback uh, from them about different in initiatives that we have. So for instance, uh, can I go back to this uh, initiative around looking at more consistency in our grading practices? That could be a place where a team can develop a, a measure um, that they can gauge student uh, and parent um, input and feedback around, um, you know, improvement areas in, re in regards to that particular area. So, you know, this is around safety and social emotional well-being. It's uh, all about, in this regard, involving student voice. 
So that specific piece about in, increasing our own flexibility and our toolbox uh, around things like surveys is a piece of that. It's basically the spirit of that item. So none of this can happen without the support of the board. I want to take this opportunity to thank the board for your support of our work in all of these areas, both in the past and to thank you in advance for your support uh, as we go into this budget season. We're actually deep in the throes of it right now. Um, <laughs> several meetings a day with uh, department leaders uh, to discuss various ways in which we can continue to align our requests to these and continuous improvement efforts. I've said before, and I'll say again, I think that in Granby, there's justifiable pride in our collective work to manage this process, to manage our budget that both maximize efficiencies, but also do, does so in a way that um, provides outstanding programming for our students. So clicking on uh, the specifics around this plan, I, I can't let this goal pass by <laughs> without mentioning this first piece, uh, which is at a, a major component for us and specifically for me over the last few years um, has been around our construction project. There's a lot to be excited about, uh, but it certainly requires uh, a heck of a lot of input uh, and time. And I want to thank Anna and, and Dr. Grossman for, for uh, their support during this process. We had a meeting this morning that was our construction meeting that are weekly. We have a meeting tomorrow night, which is our, um, our uh, almost monthly uh, building committee meetings. And it does require just a lot of connecting dots uh, in and through that, um, just to communicate about um, these developments with multiple stakeholders. So we also continue to uh, monitor class sizes and achievement data to ensure proper supports and programming. And this year, uh, we're very excited. That includes our co-teaching pilots that are in pre-AP English 9, as well as in our applied algebra classes. So that is, so those are some examples of how we're trying to both maximize efficiencies, but provide support at the same time. Any questions on Go for I have one quick question, probably Manusha, but uh, monitor class sizes. I know sometimes we have some classes that are not fully subscribed. Is there a kind of minimum that we need to reach in order to run that class? Is it um, is there a hard and fast rule? Is it a little bit more subjective? Uh, are we running classes with five or six? We really don't want to. Right. <laughs> um, right. So that's a great question. Thank you. Um, so we have a, a pretty uh, complex process um, involving our scheduling. Um, I work very closely with Mrs. Greeny uh, on this um, and several iterations to look at what our students are signing up for, again, with the goals of wanting our students to have as many opportunities as they can. So we often have very hard choices to make, um, and very often uh, we will have conversations with our department leaders that, you know what, there's just not enough kids uh, signed up for that. We can't really run it. That said, there are, on occasion, certain classes. Uh, I can think of some examples of classes like um, certain AP classes um, that we're actually trying to grow. Um, that if we can, sometimes we will, you know, have that conversation that uh, something can run if it's a little smaller than than we would like it to. Um, but that's where you know the complexity around the high school scheduling process is is its own animal, um, really. Um, and there's just a lot of pieces. It's a it's a pretty uh, complicated Sudoku, I, I like to say. Um, but uh, we do try to make sure that we have that balance and kind of, you know, uh, another example would be where we have, say, uh, multiple needs in, in a particular course, a particular area. Uh, for instance, a co-taught class. You know, we would maybe want to keep that class uh, maybe a little smaller. And if there's, a, if there's an honors class of, um, you know, honors geometry that can grow a little bit bigger than we'll Sometimes that's where the the, the uh, decision making comes in. On the flip side, do you have a maximum number of classes? So that really is a function of space. Um, so our rooms you simply. Not... Yeah. So uh, when we get up into the mid twenties, we're getting really tight with these bigger bodies, and and um, 
So, and again, that's, we're a little different than we were even a couple of years ago because a lot of the stress around that a few years ago was around distancing. So we don't have to worry as much about three feet from each other and all of that as we, as we did then. So that's a little bit different now. Mm -hmm. I didn't know if I know she to talk about younger grade. You know, she on the street for 20 years. I think of right. like that or this So or there are ways in which caps come uh we, we have to deal with things like ECE, for instance, has certain requirements about how many students can be in a particular room for, to, in order to go through the ECE, um, have that as an option. So, and then again, space uh, in terms of, you know, how many kids we can fit in a particular lab uh, or things like that. Okay, so goal number five. Um, and I always say that uh, embracing diversity and a focus on equity is really not just its own goal. It's something that permeates through. Maybe you've heard some through lines already as we work with um, trying to expand opportunities for students, if you think about equitable grading practices and things like that. So our goal under embracing diversity is also a continuation of this work that constantly tries to improve our equity lens. This is also a big piece of this is about our partnership with student-led groups as well as with district teams like our Granby equity team. Um, and again, uh, I mentioned this past summer, we had this um, virtual conference with the Great Schools Partnership around grading practices. It's grading for educational equity um, and about all the different ramifications in that. And again, we have a team that's developing around that. But this is also about creating further opportunities for students to explore connections, use their voice, have student leadership just today um, Jen Parsons and I met with Bethany Grupp, our family engagement specialist, around talking around um, how to kind of combine forces with some of our student-led groups, including groups like Bridges, Student Government, our Safe Club. Last year, uh, Mrs. Patton, I uh, want to thank her for creating an opportunity for students through a Students of Color Alliance. Uh, and then very uh, excited this year that we have our brand new course at the board. Again, thank you for your support. Uh, for the course around Black and Latino studies. Um, and just yesterday, our students in that course had an awesome trip to the Amistad, uh, which had sailed up from Mystic up to Middletown. Uh, and our kids were out there on a beautiful fall day, uh, working with staff there to really look at um, history through multiple perspectives, including the uh, Connecticut's own mixed history when it comes to slavery. So uh, that was really exciting. Hearing none. Oh, you do have a question. Okay. Um, I'm not sure, uh, but you, you mentioned something about grading for educational equity. Um, I'm not familiar with that. Uh, is there a way that that, that support? Are, are we? Is it a shift in our grading practices, or uh, I guess I would like to learn more about. It. Sure. Um, so would there be? A, Absolutely. And part of the way is on the next slide. <laughs> so um, I, that's a great uh, way to kind of segue in a few different times I have mentioned that the last time we had a NIASC accreditation, one of the recommendations was, uh, and also this is reflected very often in our student surveys, um, that our grading practices can be inconsistent and we need to be working on trying to work toward uh, more consistency in our grading practices between departments and things like that. Um, so part of what the uh, research is around there is that there are lots of different best practices that um, go into grading systems um, and including you know, things like clarity, things like alignment to essential standards and skills, and things like having, um, you know, really focusing on student mastery of, of those standards. So we know that that's actually inconsistent right now. We, we've known that. Uh, I will say that we had embarked in 2019 to begin that process. We, we had actually planned on starting this process in the spring of 2020. Well, okay. <laughs> you know what happened in the spring of 2020. So therefore, it's just been one of these things that's been hard to kind of come back to and get off the ground. 
So this summer, uh, we actually threw again the Grade Schools Partnership. There was a virtual conference. Uh, several teachers volunteered to join that. Uh, it was really exciting, uh, really good work. Um, and we kind of started an ad hoc little team. But what we're doing now, uh, and I'm going to jump into this goal now, our, our goal around um, professional learning is really about, so in a big picture, how we focus all of our staff development to support everything we've just talked about. So all of the goals that we just outlined. And this year, a pretty significant step. I want to just explain. We've always had PLC, Thursday morning, 7.30 to 8.30. It's always been and, and remains a really vital resource for us, for our teachers to work with each other in teams, to look at student data, to look at student work, to uh, refine their uh, instruction, again, to look at data around PSAT and, and make those changes as well. What we're doing this year is we're doing a lot more with departmental goals that support this continuous improvement goal. So thereby, uh, what we had had kind of in place in terms of the way we've always done PLC has been about each PLC team has a specific SMART goal. Those are now being kind of subsumed underneath the department goal system. So what that does is it frees up a little bit of time for us to finally be able to dive in to have collaborative teams that are more school-based goals. So a great example is uh, we are going to be convening a team to look at that research from the summer around grading practices. Uh, and we are going to be starting with staff. We're going to be then folding in student perspectives and parent perspectives as well as we go through the year. Another great example is our social emotional um, or a SEL slash safe school climate team. So those are teams that need time to meet uh, and we'll be using it's every fourth Thursday will be from henceforth. Uh, we will be using that time for those collaborative meetings because it, it just was really difficult to find any time outside of that to get some of that really important work done. So we're holding on to what's most essential for us with PLC. Uh, and we're also able to fold in what we're calling professional learning groups. I know we have a lot of acronyms in education, but we're calling them PLGs. And that's just a way to kind of differentiate that work from the other from the other work that we're doing. So uh, again, that's where that comes from, Rosemary, uh, in regards to the, it was a NEASC recommendation, um, and as well uh, comes from student, um, and as well as staff input around uh, working toward that consistency. And there's a process that we have that we'll be using. Um, and we also, in professional learning, uh, while on the subject of teams, uh, our school leadership team, which consists of our department leaders and our content area specialists, continues its work with the Great School Partnership because they're also part of our district leadership team. Uh, and that is around honing our practice around using protocols. Uh, protocols are uh, one of those things you can just keep getting better at uh, in terms of maximizing the efficiency of meetings and having data conversations. And also with our Great Schools Partnership, is our continued work to uh, focus on clarity of learning targets. One of the pieces that we heard from students as well, uh, a kind of a low score on our student surveys was that their response to, I, I always understand why I'm learning what we're, what we're learning. So we think that's really important for us to articulate, here's why we're doing what, what you're doing and for students to understand that. And then finally, uh, with professional learning, uh, we want to support our special education teachers is they work to transition IEPs to the new CT-SED system. I know you'll hear that from Angela as well in a couple of weeks because that's also district-wide. So that's the end of goal six. I can take questions about goal six or any other goal. I, I do understand, um, and thank you for, for clarifying the issue of consistency of grading. Um, and I think you had actually referenced it in an earlier presentation about just from one class to another um, and, and the need for that collaboration. Um, it was the, the, the equitable grading practices. That to me is a new concept that's being incorporated in the grading system. And, and maybe, and that could be a misunderstanding on my part, but I would just like some more in a nutshell with yep. the work that we did over the summer and again we were exposed to certain um, uh, research best practices um, and 
some expertise that was shared with us as we were kind of a national virtual group as we were going through these three days together. There's a lot of information around how if things aren't consistent and they're not clear, it does actually help to increase barriers for students. And it actually widens gaps as opposed to uh, allowing students to really take ownership of their learning. And that's really the goal. So uh, I, that is kind of part of the complexity of the work as we dive into it. Um, that was the title of that particular um, conference that we attended with the um, with the Great Schools Partnership as well. So there are equity-based um, ramifications when we're not doing things in a way that's consistent and it's clear, basically. Anything else from our board members? It's a lot of information to digest, and I know that this didn't happen overnight, that you recreated this uh, this report for us. So thank you for the hard work. I know this was, this looks like your summer vacation right here that you spent <laughs> doing this. So thank you, Mike, for, for all that <laughs> in your spare time. So thank you for all of that. Um, one thing I'm really excited about uh, that we've kind of, that we're doing this year is you know, we've had the schools in the spotlight, so we really, it's all about Granbury Memorial High School for, um, for the Board of Education. Uh, we started the schools in the spotlight, we had the school improvement plan, and then Friday we had the opportunity to walk through the high school with a boardwalk and kind of see all of this in action and to be able to follow up and kind of see a lot of the work that you've been doing and that you are doing. So I'm especially excited about that. So thank you in advance for taking the time, time to do that as well. Um, thank you. I don't know if anyone else has any feedback, any comments, Dr. Gross and I thought you were Yeah, so I, I just, I want to thank Mr. Dunn and his team also that the, the work that is put in and really putting a focus on one school and a meeting really allows us to, to dive in. And I got to commend the board. It's a lot of information, but to really sit back and analyze just one school at a time and see how it aligns to our strategic plan, that's really important. It, this is... The, the work that we need to do, and, and it's difficult work that we're asking the administrators to do. Um, going back to uh, board member uh, Weber's question on equitable practices for grading, I'm going to ask Mrs. Parson, we don't need to take it in action item, I'm just going to say it, that I'll ask Mrs. Parson to, uh, in, in one of her reports, just talk a little bit about grading and, and what that means, um, because there. It goes into what Mr. Dunn was talking about. There, there's something called standard-based grading, mastery-based grading, and the, the, the easiest way that I can put it, if you have a child at an elementary, middle school, or high school level that does no homework and gets A's on all their tests, but gets a B in the class, the grade is based upon the homework, which is work habit, and their grade. So the question is, is that equitable where a student that did all their homework, got 100 average, but got C's on their tests, but also got a 10? Is it equitable? So should students be graded? And that's a question I'm not giving my philosophy. I don't just trying to bait this conversation, is that equitable practice to really say what is the mastery learning of that student? So I'll ask Mrs. Parson that that's the work that she loves to do, so I'm kind of stealing her thunder <laughs> a little bit. But that that's what Mr. Dunn is trying to, to say, that that's that equitable piece of how we are grading students and we need to get it right at the high school level or in the middle school level because that's what grades so that's this is the letter grades that we're used to. So are you saying that it's a, a like a, a shift or a refocusing on standard based? Is that is that what I'm saying? It, it could be. Okay. And that's why I'm gonna let Mrs. Okay. Parsons and I'm getting into uh, her work. Um, but I see Dave's uh, smiling a little bit. There are many districts that have gone to a standards based mastery based grading that students are graded on work habits that's one piece and their assessment is another piece i'm not saying that we're there i'm just saying that that's the area that the high school is exploring and that will be 
mostly coming out of our assistant superintendent's office of instruction. So we'll make sure that she, she does that and I know she'll be excited to talk about it because that's what she does. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that would be an exciting change or direction to move in. I mean, right now, just there's so many schools across the country. I mean, grades are more about compliance and behavior and timeliness and you know, at some point you want the grade to actually reflect your ability to do physics or biology or write an English essay. So it's sort of moving in that direction. Back to that, that's what the high school's beginning to look at. And to Mr. Dunn's credit, they've wanted to look at that since 2020. Um, and it's something that I believe Mr. Rye mentioned also in the subcommittee that that was an example that he gave the subcommittee to. So we're, we're on that. It, it's just that that's a major league undertaking, and teachers need to be involved in that. As Mr. Dunn said, students need to be involved in that. Parents need to be involved in that because it is, as you're saying, Dave, that paradigm shift. It is something that is totally different. Well, so stay tuned, I guess. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dunn. Thank you. Um, we really appreciate your And time. I look forward to seeing whoever can, can join us on Friday as well. Great. If there are specific things you would like to see, then let us know. I gave Dr. So. Gross for the list. Okay, cool. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, everybody. Great. Thank you. Okay. Move on to... Uh, board Standing Committee reports, and tonight our Curriculum Policy Technology Communication Committee met. Um, Dave, would you like to give us an update on that? Yeah, we had a, a longer meeting tonight, about two hours almost. <clears throat> uh, we had no public comment. Uh, then we had the Assistant Superintendent's report, uh, in addition to the items that were already shared. They also have started uh, coaches' monthly meetings, instructional coaches. Uh, more than 100 families attended the Hartford Athletics game. Was that last week? Yeah, yeah last weekend. Uh, next week, we have a Resilient Families Training, uh, which is uh, co sponsored with East Grand Public Schools. I think the first one is on a QPR, which is a question persuade. Suicide prevention training for, for uh, parents. Uh, the new uh, teacher ed, talent ed perform uh, system has been rolled out. And uh, lastly, they met with the conservation committee about composting here in uh, the schools. We also had a report about the teacher's college writing project. Next week, next week, we're going to bring uh, two policies to the board. One about uh, duty-free periods for teachers, and a second one on revised language around truancy. And we defer to three policies to the next meeting. And then we end the meeting with a lengthy presentation from Dr. Rye on the uh, middle school student achievement and related interventions. Thank you, Dave. Questions or? Any additions? I know a lot of us were at that meeting as well. Let's know. Great. Thank you. Uh, just a note that the approved finance subcommittee meeting minutes from June are in your board packet. Other board-related reports? Correct. I don't think, Christina, they've met. No. Nope. Um, CABE, I actually attended um, in Hartford today. Uh, CABE was kind of like a legislative update uh, that they went over three different um, pieces of legislation that kind of, that changed uh, practice or just kind of made us aware. So if any of you were interested in seeing what I learned, I'd be happy to share. It was actually, it was great. If you ever have the opportunity to attend anything that CAVE uh, is offering, I highly recommend it. Granby Education Foundation, I think. No news. Okay, thank you. 
uh, calendar of events. I know that there were quite a few things on here, including as Mr. Dunn referenced earlier, there's a PAC meeting at the high school. Uh, there, I'm trying to find my calendar here, I'm sorry. There it is. Um, PAC meeting at the high school, there's a SEPTO meeting coming up. Uh, and I know that one of the things that we talked about at our board retreat in August was board attendance at some of these PAC meetings and SEPTO meetings. If anyone is planning to attend, please let me know so I can ensure that we have uh, board representatives. High school PAC, Christina. Okay. Is anyone planning to attend the SEPTO meeting or would like to attend? Whitney, thank you. Um, I'm trying to, oh, Dr. Grossman, you have a superintendent's conversation coming up. No, it, uh, oh, yeah. So, and the middle school PAC meeting will be on October 27th. I don't know if anyone's planning to attend that. We can check in next week, too. We have a meeting next week. 27th, yep. We'll check in on that next week. But Whitney, thank you. October 17th is the SEPTO meeting. Christina, October 18th is the high school PAC meeting. Um, then board member announcements. Action items? I don't think we have any. All right. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Rosemary, a second. Christina, great. All those in favor? Aye. Thank you.